Good evening, everyone, and happy St. Patrick's Day. I suppose I should have worn green this evening, and I should say thank you to Mr. Sinatra for that lovely intro music to this evening's presentation. I'm Heather Biro, the Director of Principia Lifelong Learning, and I'm joined by Marilee McFarlane, Principia Senior Director of Alumni and Field Relations, and Howie Bay, our evening speaker. We're so grateful you've joined us. With over 200 folks registered, we'd love to know where you are right now. So feel free to share your location in the chat box. Principia virtual events are so special, bringing a community together from truly around the world, whether it be our monthly book club discussions, musical concerts, the college's annual Monitor Night Live, or timely panel discussions like last month's conversations surrounding the invasion of Ukraine. Perhaps you've already joined us for an online event. But if this is your first time joining us, we welcome you and thank you. And we're gonna share a link in the chat box that will provide you access to recordings of our past events. Tonight's talk is titled Chicago, City of the Big Shoulders. Now you may know Chicago as the Windy City or the Second City and Chai Town, easily recognized for its iconic skyline, outstanding museums, and of course, Chicago style pizza. It's been called the quintessential American city. However, its story is not so well known. How did Chicago grow from a remote swamp into a city of epic proportions in the space of just 60 years? And what series of events allowed it to become the largest grain port, meatpacking plant, and lumberyard in the world? Our speaker, Howie Bay, will settle these questions and more as we discover what Carl Sandburg meant when he described Chicago as the city of the big shoulders. Now, if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, and I know you will, Consider joining Howie in August on a Principia Lifelong Learning's Majestic Great Lakes Tour. The summertime adventure begins with a night in the city of the Big Shoulders, Chicago, then sets sail on the Ocean, Ocean Voyager to explore the rich history of North America's Great Lakes. Together, we're going to discover the beauty and culture of memorable cities and sites, including Toronto, Niagara Falls, Mackinac Island, and more. Plus, we'll enjoy talks by Howie. We'll put a link to more information about this trip in the chat box, and we'd love for you to join us. For those of you who don't know, Howard, or as we all know him, Howie, grew up in St. Louis, attending Principia's lower, middle, and upper schools, graduating in 1969. He then attended Principia College and later went on to graduate school, earning a master's degree in history from the University of Missouri. Howie served Principia for almost 40 years 40 years in many capacities, house pop, social director, football and basketball coach, director of admissions and enrollment, teacher and chair of the social studies department. Howie is also a veteran teacher at alumni reunions and summer sessions. And we are so fortunate that he'll be joining us in June for this year's summer session held June 1st through 11th on the college campus. We'll put some information in the chat box for that as well. I don't wanna take up any more of Howie's time, Howie, we welcome you and we thank you for allowing some time at the end of your presentation for our guests to submit questions in the Q&A box, which Marilee and I will moderate. And for now, the screen is all yours. There we are. Good evening, everyone. Well, as you've heard, I'm calling tonight's talk, Chicago City of the Big Shoulders, which as uh, Heather mentioned, is a line from a Carl Sandburg poem called Chicago. In a tribute to the poet, President Johnson describes Sandburg as more than the voice of America, more than the poet of its strength and genius, he was America. So let's see what Sandberg had to say about Chicago. The first stanza of the poem describes Chicago as hog butcher for the world, tool maker, stacker of wheat, player with railroads and the nation's freight handler, stormy, husky, brawling, city of the big shoulders. I'll talk about what the big shoulders refers to a little bit later. But as a further introduction, I'd like to start off with 
What sparked my interest in Chicago? Was it this dramatic skyline? The stunning views? I think this is from the John Hancock Tower. Some of you may have been up there. Or perhaps it's the juxtaposition of 20th and 21st century skyscrapers. What's the appeal? What, what's the attraction? Why is it my kind of town? And uh, if you're thinking deep dish pizza, you're probably right. But seriously, what's my connection? And if you don't mind, I think I'll leave this uh, uh, slide up there a little bit longer while I answer the question. Well, it, it starts with my parents. You see, even though my dad was born and raised in St. Louis, having attended Principia all his life, and my mom, she was from New York, something attracted them to Chicago after they graduated from Principia College. My dad helped to open the very first J.C. Penney in downtown Chicago, and my mom got a job at the Art Institute, so pretty good start in the early 1950s. And before long, they were married in Chicago, and that's where I entered the story. In fact, I was born at the University of Chicago, and I guess you could say I've been in education ever since. So the subject is Chicago, and my question is, how did Chicago grow from a remote swamp into a city of epic proportions in the space of just 60 years, from a mud hole to a metropolis, as they say? Or to put it more visually, how did Chicago go from this to this? Or someday, to this? Or since it's St. Patrick's Day, I guess I should say to this. They actually do uh, dye the river, Chicago River green. Well, first let's look at where Chicago is located. As you can see, Chicago is in the southwest corner of Lake Michigan, at the far end of one of the five Great Lakes. Both Lake Michigan and Lake Superior drain into Lake Huron. Lake Huron drains into Lake Erie and Erie into Lake Ontario and then out to the Atlantic Ocean by way of the St. Lawrence River. So you have five massive freshwater lakes separating the United States in Canada. But if you look at the picture on the right, the map on the right, what people do not realize is that there are six continental divides in North America, North America. And one of them, if you'll look and see the, the one in bright pink on the map, that divide cuts right through the heart of Chicago. Now, what's the significance of this? Okay, there are two rivers in Chicago. One empties into Lake Michigan, and the other flows west through Illinois and connects to the Mississippi River. And you see the white dotted line, that represents the divide separating the Great Lakes Basin on the right of the map or, or the east, and the Mississippi River Basin on the left or the west. And in Chicago, these two rivers flowing in opposite directions are only six miles apart. Native Americans have carried their canoes over that six mile portage for thousands of years before the arrival of the French in the late 17th century. They named it Chicago. And that was because of the stinky odor that was produced by the weeds growing in this swampy, muddy area most of the year. Their Chicago was their word for wild onion or skunkweed. So Chicago means wild onion or skunkweed. Now, in 1673, the French had a, a trading post that's up in present-day Mackinac Island at the top of Lake Michigan. 
and they had heard reports of a great river to the west. So Father Marquette and Louise Juliet uh, are the ones who gave us the first written record of the portage because they went down Lake Michigan and crossed that portage to make their way to the Mississippi River. As a consequence, the Chicago portage became one of the most strategic locations in the interior of the continent. Why? Because the French uh, now had a, a much easier connection between Montreal and New Orleans. So here's a French map from 1755, and if you look carefully where Chicago is, it says Portage de Chicago. Chicago. <laughs> That's my French. By 1803, American soldiers, after winning independence from Great Britain, and of course recognizing the importance of its location, they built a fort on the Chicago River. You can see by 1820, it doesn't reveal much development. And finally, by 1833, I guess this presumably is what Chicago looked like then, it was incorporated into a town. And four years later, it was granted a city charter. And by 1840, all of a sudden, a population of 4,000. What happened? The answer is, canals happened. By taking the Hudson River north from New York City up to Albany, and then across the state of New York west, 363 miles, to Lake Erie, and then through the Great Lakes, a ship could actually reach Chicago with both products and people. A few years later, another canal opened connecting Lake Erie to the Ohio River about 300 miles to the south. And uh, would it interest you to know that prior to these two canals, the longest canal in North America was just two miles long. So this is a dramatic development. And Chicago's first mayor, William Butler Ogden, he, he witnessed the success of these canals and promoted and invested in a canal which would connect the eastward flowing Chicago River to the westward flowing Illinois River. And here's the result, the Illinois and Michigan Canal opened in 1848 and within a decade, it was carrying a staggering amount of freight. I'm, I'm talking millions of bushels of wheat and corn and pounds of pork and board feet of of lumber. The canal really made Chicago a very attractive location for manufacturers. Surprisingly, Ogden, he, he wants to open Chicago to Eastern markets. He switches his loyalty to railroad. This is his first locomotive, the Pioneer. And uh, he financed it in a very interesting way. He sold shares of stock on a monthly payment plan to the farmers and business, small businessmen whose land lay along the proposed rail line. And it, it took off. In fact, soon all of the farmer's grain is coming to, from the Great Plains into the city of Chicago. And by the 1860s, Chicago's the railroad hub of America. More railroads met in Chicago than anywhere else in the world. And it was men like Ogden, as much as the location, that would make it the great city of the Midwest. As Carl Sandburg said, player with railroads and the nation's freight handler. Now, Ogden would later become president of the Union Pacific, which extends Chicago's rail lines all the way to the West Coast. And he was also the first to invest in this man and his uh, horse-drawn reaper. No one did more to transform American agriculture than Cyrus McCormick. Now, prior to McCormick's machine, uh, this is how you would reap your grain, your wheat. 
with a handheld sickle or scythe. And that had remained unchanged for like 5,000 years. So essentially, the amount of grain that a farmer, like this guy, could reap during the short time that the wheat was ripe before it began to decay, which is about two weeks, would determine how much he could reasonably plant in the first place. But now, with the reaper, he could harvest as much wheat in a day as a farmer could in two weeks using the sickle. So of course, this is gonna to lead to uh, much, much more uh, wheat and more farms, and of course, motivated hundreds, if not thousands of Americans to move west to begin new farms. So McCormick is, he's likely the first tool maker referred to in Sandberg's poem. But besides inventing and manufacturing his reaper, McCormick, McCormick's genius was also as a in marketing. Um, 15 acres or your money back would, was one of his guarantees. Or um, $120, take it or leave it. That kind of removed the hassle of bickering over the price. He also allowed farmers to buy on credit and he developed interchangeable replacement parts, that had them readily available, and he educated farmers with demonstrations. And then he trained his employees on the mechanics of his machine and sent them out as the first traveling salesman. What did all this lead up to? By 1860, he's selling over 4,000 reapers a year, and he was the city of Chicago's largest employer. And with the invention of the grain elevator, the Chicago grain trade went from about 2 million bushels a year to 50 million bushels a year in just a decade. It used to take a crew all day to load about 7,000 bushels of wheat into a boat. The same amount could flow into the holds of a lake boat from the elevators in about an hour and operated by just one man. So it's no surprise, by the mid 1880s, McCormick is selling over 50,000 machines a year. And Chicago, he helps Chicago overtake Odessa in Russia as the greatest grain port in the world. The city could literally boost, boast that it fed the world. So as Sandberg said, tool maker and stacker of wheat. Of course, the farmers, they're in these treeless prairies, so they need lumber for their houses and their fences and their barns. And there was a seemingly endless supply of white pine forests up in Michigan and Wisconsin. So Chicago then becomes the largest lumber market in the world by the time of the Civil War. By 1860, Chicago's population had grown from 4,000 to 93,000. I think it's important to remember that Chicago started out as a swamp where you would never build a city. The location of the city was suited for commerce, but not for habitation. It was so wet in the spring that horses literally had to be dug out of the mud. There, there were even signs where to warn people about the mud, signs which read no bottom here or um, fastest route to China. Uh, a popular joke from the time, a man's walking down the street and he discovers another traveler who is buried up to his shoulders in the mud in the road. And the man asks the traveler, hey, you need any help? And the traveler says, oh, no, thank you. I have a good horse under me. So an even more pressing problem involving drainage was what to do about waste. Up until 1855, Chicago had no sewers. So in a very dramatic attempt to rescue the city, officials hired this man, Ellis. Vester 
Hesbro. Uh, he was famous for his work in, in the Boston water system as an engineer, and he would attempt to raise Chicago out of the muck. His idea was to lay the sewers above the streets, the existing streets, and position them so that gravity would carry their contents into the Chicago River. He then filled the streets with dirt and covered the sewers and then elevated the city streets as much as eight feet above the buildings that flank them. Well, that's when another engineer, George Pullman, came in. He devised a method whereby he could raise buildings. Some people wanted them moved, but others just wanted them raised up to the new level of the street. In the case of the Briggs Hotel, he devised a method whereby 250 men operating about a thousand jacks around the base of the building would all, when they heard the sound of a whistle, they would all turn their jack a quarter turn and little by little, they would hoist up the building. This is with diners and hotel guests still inside. George Pullman jacked up Chicago. Unfortunately, the sewers flooded the river with waste, causing new problems because the Chicago River flowed directly into Lake Michigan, which was the city's source of drinking water. So Chesbro is, then des designs a new drainage, a new water system. It had an intake tunnel about two miles out into the lake and about 30 feet below the surface of Lake Michigan. The idea was that water obviously flow by gravity through the tunnel and then be pumped up into a water tower and then into the city's water mains. And of course, just as he had calculated, this seemed to work because the volume of sewage was small and the lake water was diluting its polluting effects, except that Chicago's population then tripled from 100,000 to 300,000 uh, and the smell of the river just became unbearable. Um, pollution began to flow into the city's drinking water and uh, they needed to come up with an, a different solution. So they gave Chesbro one more chance and this is what he had to say. The way we're gonna solve this thing is to do something nobody's ever done in the history of the world. We're gonna tell a river to go where God didn't want it to go. We're gonna send it another way. We're gonna reverse the darn thing. Chesbro actually ordered deeper channels to be dug and they redirected the Chicago River away from the Great Lake. It no longer emptied into Lake Michigan. So this is a kind of a crucial juncture in the story of Chicago and its miraculous rise, this reversal of the river. In less than 40 years, Chicago had grown from this fur trading post to a booming metropolis. More vessels arrived in Chicago than any other city in America. More than uh, 270 lumber boats every 12 hours miles and miles of docks and swing bridges along the route. And then, disaster. More than two thirds of Chicago's buildings were made entirely of wood. Warehouses, bridges, city streets, sidewalks, all wood. The fire, devastated the city's business district. In minutes, most of Chicago's landmark buildings were gone. Over a third of the city's population was now homeless. 73 miles of streets, 17,000 buildings destroyed. 
seemed like only the water tower was left standing. And it's, it's by the way, it's still there. And yet the stockyards and the packing plants on the south side were untouched. And the wharfs and the lumber yards and the mills and the grain elevators were to the south, so they survived. Most of the railroads were not damaged, which allowed shipments of aid to come pouring in from around the world. England sent 8,000 books to replace those that must have been lost in the library. Even Queen Victoria personally inscribed 1,000 books. Okay. Chicago didn't have a public library yet. They, they will build one eventually. So the rebuilding of Chicago, it started immediately. This is Joseph Medill. He, his Chicago Tribune building had already been destroyed by the blaze. So he hurried to the safe west side and he rented a printing plant and published a lead editorial, which would serve to boost the city's morale even while the ground was still hot. And here it is. It has a headline, cheer up. In the midst of a calamity without parallel in the world's history, looking upon the ashes of 30 years accumulations, people of this once beautiful city have resolved that Chicago shall rise again. And just Two short years, Potter Palmer, whose first hotel was lost just two weeks after he had opened it in the fire, he would advertise his new Palace Hotel, look at that, as the only thoroughly fireproof hotel in the world. Mary Baker Eddy actually stayed there in, in 1888. George Pullman, remember, he's the one who jacked up the Briggs Hotel. It too was lost in the Great Fire, but he took the capital he had earned from raising hundreds of buildings and developed a new venture. He built luxury railroad cars, called them palace cars, and his cars were had elegant restaurants in them and sleeper compartments, and of course, impeccable service. It made him a fortune within two years of the fire. Mail order giants, Montgomery Ward, and later Richard Sears, sent catalogs, fondly known as wish books, to households all across America. I've got mine, sort of the Walmart or the Amazon.com of, of its day. Sears had grown up on a farm, so he catered to the rural customer by sending his 500 page catalog. He mailed it to 300,000 homes every year, many in very remote areas. And then there's the Union Stockyards. The scale, the area and the scale of these stockyards, coupled with advancements in railroads and refrigeration, allowed for some of the companies to become global. Most impressive was the risk-taking by such entrepreneurs as Gustafa Swift and Philip Armour. Armour and Swift opened meat packing plants that were unrivaled for their sheer size and innovations. Chicago would indeed be entitled to Carl Sandburg's opening line, hog butcher of the world. But what about this moniker, city of the big shoulders? I believe Sandberg wanted to create a picture in, the, in his reader's mind of Chicago as a giant hardworking man who could seemingly take on any uh, difficulty or demanding task. Of course, that was pretty true after the Great Fire. He, he saw someone, he, he was describing someone as having broad shoulders as able to take a lot of responsibility. 
and not be easily dissuaded by a failed attempt or upset by criticism. So ultimately, I think Sandberg called Chicago the city of the big shoulders because of it, it's just so important to the nation. So let's conclude. The promise of Chicago's geography was immediately obvious to the first Europeans who passed through in the late 17th century. And it wasn't until the second half of the 19th century that you have water transportation as the only way to move trade goods and people around North America. So connections between strategic waterways, like having a portage or later a man-made canal, was of special importance. Remember, Chicago's strategic location on Lake Michigan and because of the continental divide that runs right through it, with one river flowing east and one river flowing west, Chicago had a commanding position, controlling access from the Great Lakes into the Mississippi River Basin. So really, Chicago's history is confirming the old adage, geography is destiny. And yet, isn't it humans who get to decide what that destiny means? I mean, after all, it required big shoulders to dig canals or to lay railroad tracks or, or to jack up buildings or to reverse the course of a river. It took big shoulders to manufacture 50,000 reapers a year, ship lumber and grain all over the world process more pork and beef than anywhere else on earth? And yes, to rebuild a city in just two years after the most devastating fire of the age? In 1893, just 60 years after Chicago's incorporation as a town in 1833, Chicago invited the world for a visit. Over 27 million people attended Chicago's World Fair. And it, it seemed to show that Chicago had indeed risen from the ashes of the great Chicago fire. No longer a mud hole, the fair's gleaming white palaces earned Chicago a new nickname, the White City. But of course, Today, Chicago is also known as the Windy City, the Second City, the city that works, Chi Town, and of course, the city of big shoulders, stormy, husky, brawling. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. We'll, we'll open this up now for um, listeners to share um, remarks or ask questions, they can be asked in the Q&A box. Um, so if you'd submit them that way, then we'll, we'll watch for them and we can read them out to Howie and Howie you can, can answer to all then. Um, while folks are gathering their questions, I have a question to start. I, I realize your talk focused on how fast Chicago grew over its first 60 years, but mm -hmm. how big is Chicago now? And is it still the city of Big Shoulders? Is it still the second city? Okay. Uh, well, no, it's, it's now the third largest city uh, it, behind New York, of course, and Los Angeles. Uh, its population is approaching 3 million. Uh, Chicago is in Cook County, which uh, Chicago represents probably half of the population of Cook County. And Cook County, it would, if it was a state, would be the second, 22nd largest state in the union. Um, so I would say city of big shoulders, um, about 50% of all the uh, rail freight continues to pass through Chicago. Um, the GDP of Chicago is one of the largest in the world at a, approaching 700 billion. Um, the 
Uh, Chicago area is home to quite a few Fortune 500 companies like Boeing, uh, Caterpillar, uh, ConAgra, McDonald's, Kraft, Heinz, Motorola, Sears, of course, United Airlines, uh, U.S. Food, Walgreens. I mean, yes, um, they have the largest convention center in North America, McCormick Place, named after, of course, McCormick family. Um, yes, I would say they are still the city of big shoulders, uh, but they're no longer second city. We still call them second city, but they are now the third city. I suppose. Thank you so much. How did the rivalry with St. Louis get started? Wow. Is there any significance to this rivalry or is it mostly just about baseball? Uh, yes. Well, of course, I as fond as I am of Chicago, I am very much a Cardinal fan. Um, and, uh, and I think the, the rivalry really goes back. Um, you know, St. Louis wanted that World's Fair in 1893. They were bidding for it and Chicago got it instead. So a few years later, Chicago or St. Louis uh, came up with its own World's Fair just a few years later, 10 years later, maybe. Um, what happened was that St. Louis was the gateway to the West prior to the Civil War, but they did not have a bridge across from Illinois to Missouri uh, uh, at, at St. Louis. So whenever a train came up to uh, the Mississippi River, there's no bridge for it to go across. So they had to take everything off the freight cars and put them on barges and then take them just across the river and take them off the barges and put them back onto St. Louis's side and then onto trains. It, was, it wasn't the best way to do it. Um, and then once the Civil War occurs, uh, St. Louis is pretty much closed to any kind of shipping. So Chicago really started to grow at that point because they were feeding all the soldiers uh, all across the North uh, with the grain and the, and the uh, pork and the beef. And uh, the trains just grew exponentially in Chicago and they, St. Louis never could catch up. Howie, uh, at what point does Chicago become a city known for its architecture? And what attracted so many illustrious architects to the city and who were its first architects? Oh, yes. Well, you'll need to come on the, on the uh, tour of the Great Lakes with me in August uh, because uh, I, only having 30 minutes here, I had to end pretty much with the uh, World's Fair. But that World's Fair in 1893 attracted many people 27 million came to, to Chicago, but it attracted so many people to the city. And many of them were uh, architects. And of course, uh, Louis Sullivan, uh, you have the first skyscraper in Chicago. Uh, you have Daniel Burnham, you have, uh, I, I really would love to continue my talk and talk all about the architecture because it's one of my favorite things about Chicago, as you can see from the picture that's that's still up. Um, I don't think that's a very complete answer, but I think uh, it was really the, the World's Fair in 1893 that uh, brought all this attention to um, how they could build. I will say that one of the people we didn't mention uh, was uh, Marshall Field. So I just, I'll leave it at that. Well, the, there were some wonderful department stores and the Magnificent Mile. And uh, of course, then you start getting into um, uh, the tremendous park that is all along the edge of, of Lake Michigan and how important it was that the uh, park never be built on, and it's, it's still true today. 
That's great. Who was the industrialist who sued the city on his own to make Lake Michigan accessible to every citizen? Um, well, I think that's who we were just um, about to talk about. Montgomery Ward uh, kind of saved that open space. And uh, it, I mean, I think uh, uh, Montgomery Ward, I think, is the one who sued. He had to sue a number of times. Uh, and it's a, a very large um, open space, which um, your Navy Pier all the way down towards where the, the World's Fair had been. You have the Art Institute, you have um, Museum of uh, the Field Museum and the Museum of Science and Industry and the Adler Planetarium. All of those um, have been uh, great features of that area, but it's also a tremendous park. I, I had a beautiful picture of it in my show, but because we were trying to shorten it, uh, I didn't keep it in. I wish I had now. How did the elevator originate in Chicago? Do you know? The grain elevators did not. No, they originated back east, but they were really the first skyscrapers of Chicago. Um, and of course, there were probably, oh, I don't know, nine or 10 of them that were still there after the Chicago fire. Um, and they greatly, you see, it, it, you used to take the bushels of wheat and put them on a, a boat and take them down to St. Louis. And so you had to take them on and off and on and off so many times, whereas the grain elevator allows you to um, fill up a, a boat, um, a ship, and take it out into the Great Lakes and all the way to anywhere in the world. A tremendous uh, advantage that Chicago had because of that. That's great. Can you share a little bit more about the Pullman Village as a company as a company town? Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, George Pullman, uh, in the southern part of the city, uh, created a, a, a town just for his employees. And uh, if you worked for him, uh, you were eligible to live there. The homes were had plumbing. They had uh, uh, paved streets and sidewalks and gutters. Um, you had a library. You had a store. You had church. A church. It was it was really something. And, um, and of course, that was a real bonus for being an employee. But he also was very strict about alcohol and other vices, and they were um, forbidden. And so a lot of his workers, they rebelled against that. Um, but that was the, those were the terms. Well, there was a downturn in the economy, and instead of lowering their rent or lowering their, um, or, or giving them any kind of uh, financial help, um, he raised their rent to keep his investors happy. And, um, but he didn't raise their uh, wage. And so there was a, I'm not gonna call it a riot, it was more of a strike and all of the railroad, uh, workers in other parts of the town or even across the country uh, honored that strike. So the railroads basically shut down because of um, Pullman's decision to uh, lower their wages but not lower their rent. I hope that answers it. Well, 
We've got a question about the books. What happened to the 8,000 books donated by Great Britain after the Great Fire? And, and then how long did it take Chicago to finally build a public library? Okay, yeah. Um, well, the, uh, the library actually opened its doors almost right away because of these books. Um, everyone's private collection had pretty much gone up in the blaze. Uh, all of these wonderful private libraries uh, were, were lost. But uh, a, a public library was opened, of all places, in an abandoned iron water tank. And um, I've seen pictures of it. It was a temporary location, but it was kind of neat uh, to go to. And then it kind of moved from place to place until a permanent site was finally um, selected, and it opened 26 years later, uh, after the fair, I mean, 1897, I think, was when the library finally opened. And it's a beautiful building. It's still there, but it's no longer the library. I think it's just a cultural center or something. That's so fascinating. It would be fun to you know, see them. One of the attendees said that when she worked in Chicago, she was able to see some of the books and the original signature from the Queen. So, how about that? Yeah, a fun addition. Well, Can you really, share? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Was, was uh, worldwide. I mean, people all over the world tried to help. They sent uh, aid to the city. Which were the original Native American tribes that inhabited the area before the Europeans arrived? Oh my, well, there were so many. Um, the Miami is, comes to mind. Um, I would say they were the ones that uh, were there when, when Joliet and Marquette came through and guided them. In fact, what had happened is that Marquette and Joliet actually missed the portage on their way to the Mississippi River. And, uh, but it was on their way back that they, Indians said, you know, there's a, a shortcut and showed them the portage. Um, but th that's the, um, the Indian tribe that I would associate with, with that particular moment. There were so many, I mean, it was uh, certainly a thousand years or more of, Native Americans uh, being in that area. But the only recorded history that we have starts with Marquette and Joliet. Howie, um, we've got a few people asking how Chespro reversed the Chicago River. <laughs> well, he, he did it simply by digging, but uh, it, it was only successful for about a year. Um, the river has been successfully reversed, but it, it actually took longer than what Chesbro was able to accomplish. Um, if you look, he, what he did was deepen the Illinois and, and Michigan Canal. Remember the canal that they opened in 1848? He deepened it enough to reverse the river's flow, but really only for about one season. Um, the, the real story is a little more involved. It took a lot more engineering. And essentially what happened was a 28 mile drainage canal known as the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal, much bigger, uh, connected Chicago directly to the Illinois River. And so it, it definitely is still the case. It, it reversed the direction of the, the main part and the south branch of the Chicago River. And uh, so now water flows out of Lake Michigan rather than into it. Um, and in fact, it's designed, this canal is designed to take water from Lake Mich Michigan and discharge it into the Mississippi River watershed. And you build dams and then you dig and then you open the dams and you dig some more and you widen the channel. It's, um, you, can, you can drive up there and see it still in operation. Um, 
but there's been a lot of lawsuits that have gone all the way to the Supreme Court um, because uh, Lake Michigan isn't supposed to drain into the Mississippi River. And so they've had to um, limit how much water is allowed to do that. There's also been a lot of um, issues with some invasive species of, of fish that they don't want to get into Lake Michigan. So not to mention that way back when uh, the people downriver weren't exactly pleased to have sewage coming uh, into Illinois instead of going out into the Lake Michigan. Should have been going either place, but there you go. That's great. Well, this has been so fascinating. We're already receiving requests to do a round two and a focus on architecture. And I know you will be talking about um, this, all of these topics on the trip, but maybe we'll have you introduce some of these in how we will be teaching at summer session, as Heather said, and at both college reunions this summer. So lots of opportunities to hear Howie this year. Um, but Howie, our final question okay. for you, and you may have touched on this, but would love any more details that you have of how did they make it so that the buildings could be built on a swamp? <laughs> uh, well, it's it's mainly a swamp during the rainy season, sure, but uh, you know you drive piles down in just like they had to do with the mother church. They had to uh, drive logs down into the into the mud until they could get enough um, to solid something solid. Uh, but keep in mind that that the portage area is the muddy part. That's the, the um, uh, just six miles between the two rivers. It's not like the entire area uh, you can't build on. Um, the, the mud was the result of the fact that the land and the river, or are, 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 excuse me, the, the river flowing into Lake Michigan and the land on either side of it are almost the same level. And so that's why they had to, to uh, build up. And so um, they actually raised the entire city. <laughs> that helps a little bit. Howie, we have, we have so many questions. I think a round two is definitely going to be needed, but our time is at an end this evening. And I want to thank you for this fascinating look at Chicago. Um, having grown up and visiting Chicago several times. I look forward to seeing it again with a new perspective. Um, and for anyone who joined us late or would like to share this talk with others, we'll be posting a recording on our events webpage. And I encourage everyone to visit principiaalumni.org because here you'll find information about lifelong learning trips, including the Great Lakes trip. Um, in addition to that, we've got programs to Kenya, the Galapagos Islands, Japan, America's Southern states. Um, we also have information about more upcoming virtual events, including conversations around diversity, inclusion, and belonging, which is a live panel discussion on March 22nd, and this month's book talk with Linda Conradi on March 29th. So Howie, our gratitude to you again, and a warm thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. I wish you all a good night.